May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Please be seated. Some years ago, in my last tour in Germany, it was during the um, Iraq and Afghanistan wars, and the chaplaincy was getting low on chaplains, so they reached out to some other countries, and we started to receive some African chaplains as well as some from, um, from the Philippines. Well, we received an African chaplain at Grafenbeer, and to welcome him, a few of us as chaplains went out with him to our favorite guest house, and we sat around and ate and had some of those wonderful Bavarian brews. And we uh, shared stories and laughed. Uh, at some point in the conversation, it came out that this man was also a chief in his tribe. And we were so fascinated with it, we started grilling him. And so we found out that when there was a ceremony or something, he had a special place he had to sit in the community, and he had to wear special ceremonial robes. So I asked him, wow, can we see your robes sometime? He was quite a character, and he put his hand over his heart, and he said, first, you must slaughter me a goat. <laughs> so we all laughed. And then one of the other chaplains, who was a hunter, said, well, how about if I shoot a deer? And he again put his hand over his heart, and he said, it must be an animal from your own fold. He was just a lot of fun until it became time for the annual physical fitness test. And I wasn't sure if he was kidding on this one or not. I chose to take it as a joke. But I said, um, Father Kavenge, are you uh, ready for your PT test? And uh, he said, yeah, push-ups and sit-ups are fine. And I said, well, how about your two-mile run? And he looked at me and he said, a chief never runs. We have young men to run for us. Well, that didn't work on the PT test. He had to do it himself. He did pass, but so it was good. But in our story today, we read, we hear a story from Jesus about a father who had distinction and place in his community who did some rather shameful things to include running. So you know the story pretty much by heart. It's the, one of the more famous stories in the New Testament of these three characters. And we look often at that first one, the prodigal son, who has the audacity to go to his father before his father has died and said, well, you're giving me my inheritance. Now that was absolutely a horrible thing in Israel to go and ask your parents, your dad, for your inheritance. It was like saying, I wish you were dead. So somehow then, he turned whatever was his inheritance, and by the way, inheritance would be land and property and cattle. He turned that into something he could, that was portable, gold or some kind of coins, and he headed off to this other country. But you know, just the act of selling land, this land that Israel had come into in the Exodus, that God had gone before them and wiped out all these other tribes, and this was their inherited sacred land. In Israel, land is sacred even still, but back then, even more so. And he sold that inheritance from God. He shamed his whole family. And then it gets worse. And you can almost picture Jesus telling the story to a group of Pharisees. And he wants to build up this sense of this absolutely shameful experience with these three uh, characters. So this boy goes off and he spends his inheritance on loose living. So Jesus is probably enjoying just watching the Pharisees' faces as he goes from one level of awful to the next. And then he says, and it gets worse. He goes and hires himself out to a person in the land, a Gentile, who raises pigs, and a Jew working for a Gentile, not even as a slave. Slaves at least had a place to eat and to sleep. He was a hireling. He didn't have a place for anything. He was paid a daily wage. And he went and he ate the pods that the pigs were eating. So again, I can just picture Jesus having the most fun watching these Pharisees just, oh, this is horrible. But then at last he comes to his own. And he says, I can go home and be with my father. And I can almost hear the Pharisees thinking, oh good, then he's gonna go back and face justice and be punished for what he did. But then the story gets even worse. Because the dad is watching for his son. He sees him from afar and he hikes up his robes and he runs. A horribly shameful thing to do in that culture for a man of standing within his community. 
And then he brings his son home. He says, get the best robe. Well, whose robe was it that had the best robe? It was the man of honor. He was like the chief. He had a special robe for important occasions, and he gave it to this son. Put a ring on his finger, like a signet ring. That's where he could put his stamp as if he had the authority of his father. And he put shoes on his feet. Oh, my. And then it gets worse. So Jesus, again, just looking at those Pharisees, let's make it even more uncomfortable for them. The dad then throws a party for the whole town. And I'm thinking, okay, the Pharisees are like, okay. So the town at least will know you don't follow, you don't reward this kind of behavior. We'll all boycott it. But no, they all show up. So the Pharisees are just having the worst time with this whole thing. And then it gets a little bit worse, maybe even a lot worse, because there's only one person boycotting the meal, and that's the elder brother. And Jesus is telling the story against the Pharisees. They are the elder brother, and they probably caught on at this point and just wouldn't go into the party. Nope. Father came out and said, what's wrong? Come on in. Enjoy it. And the younger, I mean, the older brother says to his dad in a very mouthy way, judgmentally, why would you ever do this for him? I've been with you all along, and you never filled the, killed the fatted calf for me. Remember, at the beginning of the story, it says when, they, when the father gave his inheritance to that younger boy, it said he divided it among them. This older boy already had his inheritance. He had everything that belonged to the father, and he still wasn't grateful. Well, you can almost hear this crowd I mean, the, the people who were listening to the story, thinking about these two boys and how the father was so, oh, just over the top gracious and too kind to them and didn't punish them. You can almost hear them thinking, why, if they were my boys, I would, and then just fill in the blank with whatever kind of punishment you would think would be appropriate for this level of shame that was going on in Israel. It's a wonderful story, and Jesus is telling it to a group of people who had complained to him about the parties that he was going to. And he told a story of a lost coin, a lost sheep, and then he, his, this is his final flourish to tell this story about how important it is to have parties when the lost are found. The only defense that this father had to his, to his oldest son was, your brother was lost, and now he's found. How can we not celebrate? And that was the point for Jesus. How can we not celebrate when someone who was lost has been found? Well, many of us struggle with this story because we often just focus on that prodigal son. And we have heard sermons over and over, and they're good sermons, about no matter how bad you are, you can come home to the Father and be forgiven, and you will, be, you will receive a robe of righteousness. You will be given the signs of sons and daughters. Just come on home. And those are wonderful sermons, and I... They are good. But we miss the scandal of this story because this story is really about the father more so than the boys. It's a picture of who Jesus is, and Jesus is the revelation of the father. So it is telling us about the father. This is an image of God that we have to struggle with like when we had this the image of God two Sundays ago about the flapping chicken. Jesus saying, I like a hen, I would like to, and all the hen can do is offer up itself as a meal for the predator. Well, here we have another image of God that we have to struggle with, that this God is not the one who grabs hold of power and violence, but is a God who is gracious and forgiving and seems to stop at no barriers, even social barriers of shame and honor. So for us to really enter into the story, I'm just going to offer a few things as our lens. The honor-shame cultures, well, they're still around even in this 21st century. They're more in the developing nations. But at the first century in the Mediterranean, that's all there was, honor-shame cultures. And just a view of that, if a man had, had standing, and it was always a man, who was the head of the family, the patra familius, if he had standing, then he had to play the role. He had to continually watch his social capital, if you will, 
If he had honor, he enjoyed it, but he had to keep it. And if anyone ever challenged it, he had to fight back, whether it was with words or in the courts or with violence, but he had to keep his place in the community. Women in those days just needed to be pure and submissive in order to be honorable. And sons had to be strong, manly, but also obedient to their fathers. And if anyone stepped out of line, it was up to the head of the family to, in a sense, smack them back into place. In this story, we see the father breaking so many rules of an honor-shame culture. Instead of punishing his sons, he actually gives them an inheritance. Instead of walking with dignity, he runs. And he leaves a party that he was the host of to placate his older son. So that's important for us to realize that honor-shame cultures, which is not what we have, but it's a predominant engine that drives the train in all through the Old Testament and New Testament. The second thing is that we need to focus in on this dad to just see what kind of a picture of Jesus and of the Father we are receiving from him. And we know that as we look at the revelation of God through Jesus, that continually throughout the whole ministry of Jesus' life, he rejected honor and shame rules. He was the one who told his followers, don't worry about money or property. It's not important. Sell it. You don't need it. That was very important in an honor-shame culture. You had to have property to be the head of the family. And he told them to never commit violence. Never fight back. Turn your cheek. That was, again, a horrible thing to say in an honor-shame culture. And who were his friends? There were so many dishonorable women among his friends that it was a scandal. For every time he had a personal relationship with another woman, especially with those prostitutes that he was having parties with, it was a horror to their culture because it was so shameful. And then we see Jesus continuing to go down that spiral of shame to where he washed his disciples' feet on that Thursday night and then submitted to a cross which is the most shameful image of death that we can ever, ever think of in any culture at any time in history. See, the point of this story is that God loves us so much that rules don't matter. The defense of the father was, I couldn't do anything else. He's my son and he has returned. And that is the picture of the God that we worship the one who says, there are rules, they're important, but they're not more important than my kids. That's my daughter, that's my son. I'm sorry, but I'm not gonna follow your rules, folks. These images of God shock us into finding a new way to love God rather than fear God. And Jesus wants us to love God and to show that evil is truly evil and it will kill God and God will allow it so that evil can be seen for what it is and God can be seen for the love that God is. So I wanna just close with a story of another shocking image that I think kind of says something to us about how maybe this whole thing works. So years ago, I heard this story, it was from a pastor and he told about his childhood. And he was such a wonderful person. No one could ever imagine him having ever done anything wrong but evidently he was naughty as a child. Nowhere near as naughty as I was, but he would steal snacks on occasion. To me, that's just like low level naughty, hardly even registers for the stuff that I did, but okay. And his mom was really upset about it and would try everything she could to keep him from stealing those snacks, those cookies between meals. She'd reason with him, she'd scold him, she'd express her disappointment in him, and nothing worked. So finally she said, go into the backyard and cut me a switch. So he went out there very slowly, of course, thinking about what, how this was gonna play out. And he was gonna get a beating, he was sure. So he brought in this switch, she tested it against her hand, 
I said, yep, this will do just fine. And then she handed the switch to her son. And she turned around and she bent over and she said, now you spank me with that. And he said, I can't do that. She said, you have to. I've tried everything I can to let you know that what you're doing is not right. And now you need to punish me. So in his tears, he hit her maybe lightly a few times and he sobbed so much, it broke his heart. And after that, he said he never wanted to steal another snack again because he saw what the result was, that this woman who he loved so much was hurt by it and he was the one who was hurting her. And that I think is a picture of the cross, that it shows us that God's saying, I've tried everything folks, here, you punish me. And for some people, it wasn't a horror. They thought they were doing the right thing. But for the rest of us, it's a shocking image that changes our hearts. And Jesus became shame for us to show us how horrible sin is and how great the Father's love is for all of us, his sons and daughters. Amen.